The Odyssey of Homer. Book 24. The Ithacans bury the wars, and sitting in council resolve on revenge. And coming near the house of Laertes, are met by Odysseus, and Laertes with Telemachus and servants, the whole number twelve, and are overcome, and submit. Now Selene and Hermes called forth from the halls the souls of the wars, and he held in his hand his wand that is fair and golden, wherewith he lulls the eyes of men, of whomso he will, while others again he even wakens out of sleep. Herewith he roused and led the souls who followed gibbering. So these were flocking round Achilles, and the spirit of Agamemnon, son of Atreus, drew nigh sorrowful, and about him were gathered all the other shades, as many as perished with him in the house of Aegisthus, and met their doom. Now the soul of the son of Peleus spake to him first, saying, Son of Atreus, verily we deemed that thou above all other heroes wast ever more dear to Zeus, whose joy is in the thunder, seeing that thou wast lord over warriors, many and mighty men, in the land of the Trojans where we Achaeans suffered affliction. But lo, the too was deadly doom to visit early, the doom that none avoids of all men born. Ah, would that in the fullness of thy princely honor, thou hadst met death and fate in the land of the Trojans. So would all the Achaean host have builded thee a barrow, yea, and for thy son thou wouldst have won great glory in the aftertime. But now it has been decreed for thee to perish by a most pitiful death. Then the soul of the son of Atreus answered, and spake, Happy art thou son of Peleus, godlike Achilles, that didst die in Troyland far from Argos, and about thee fell others, the best of the sons of Trojans and Achaeans, fighting for thy body, but thou in the whirl of dust layest mighty and mightily fallen, forgetful of thy chivalry. And we strove the livelong day, nor would we ever have ceased from the fight, if Zeus had not stayed us with a tempest. Anon when we had borne thee to the ships from out of the battle, we laid thee on a bier and washed thy fair flesh clean with warm water and unguents, and around thee the Danans shed many a hot tear and shore their hair. And forth from the sea came thy mother with the deathless maidens of the waters, when they heard the tidings, and a wonderful wailing rose over the deep, and trembling fell on the limbs of all the Achaeans. Yeah, and they would have sprung up and departed to the hollow ships, had not one held them back that knew much law from of old, Nestor, whose counsel proved heretofore the best. Out of his good will he made harangue, and spake among them. Hold, ye Argives, flee not, young lords of the Achaeans. Lo, his mother from the sea is she that comes, with the deathless maidens of the waters, to behold the face of her dead son. So he spake, and the high-hearted Achaeans ceased from their flight. Then round thee stood the daughters of the ancient one of the sea, holding a pitiful lament, and they clad thee about in raiment incorruptible. And all the nine muses one to the other replying with sweet voices began the dirge, there thou wouldest not have seen an argive but wept, so mightily rose up the clear chant. Thus for seventeen days and nights continually did we all bewail thee, immortal gods and mortal men. On the eighteenth day we gave thy body to the flames, and many well-fatted sheep we slew around thee, and kind of shambling gait. So thou wert burned in the garments of the gods, and in much unguents and in sweet honey, and many heroes of the Achaeans moved mail-clad around the pyre when thou wast burning, both footman and horse, and great was the noise that arose. But when the flame of Hephaestus had utterly abolished thee, lo, in the morning we gathered together thy white bones, Achilles, and bestowed them in unmixed wine and in unguents. Thy mother gave a twy handled golden urn, and said that it was the gift of Dionys, and the workmanship of renowned Hephaestus. Therein lie thy white bones, great Achilles, and mingled there with the bones of Patroclus son of Menoetius, that is dead, but apart is the dust of Antilochus, whom thou didst honor above all thy other companions, after Patroclus that was dead. Then over them did we pile a great and goodly tomb, we the holy host of Argive warriors, high on a jutting headland over wide Hellespont, that it might be far seen from off the sea by men that now are, and by those that shall be hereafter. Then thy mother asked the gods for glorious prizes in the games, and set them in the midst of the lists for the champions of the Achaeans. In days past thou hast been at the funeral games of many a hero, when so, after some king's death, the young men gird themselves and make them ready for the meed of victory, but couldst thou have seen these gifts thou wouldst most have marveled in spirit, such glorious prizes did the goddess set there to honor thee, even the tees, the silver-footed, for very dear wert thou to the gods. Thus not even in death hast thou lost thy name, but to thee shall be a fair renown for ever among all men, Achilles. But what joy have I now herein, that I have wound up the clue of war, for on my return Zeus devised for me an evil end at the hands of Aegisthus and my wife accursed. 
So they spake one to the other. And nigh them came the messenger, the slayer of Argos, leading down the ghosts of the wolves by Odysseus slain, and the two heroes were amazed at the sight and went straight toward them. And the soul of Agamemnon, son of Atreus, knew the dear son of Melanius, renowned Amphimedon, who had been his host, having his dwelling in Ithaca. The soul of the son of Atreus spake to him first, saying, Amphimedon, what hath befallen you, that ye have come beneath the darkness of earth, all of you picked men and of like age? It is even as though one should choose out and gather together the best warriors in a city. Did Poseidon smite you in your ships and rouse up contrary winds and the long waves? Or did unfriendly men, perchance, do you hurt upon the land as ye were cutting off their oxen and fair flocks of sheep, or while they fought to defend their city and the women thereof? Answer and tell me, for I avow me a friend of thy house. Rememberest thou not the day when I came to your house in Ithaca with godlike Menelaus, to urge Odysseus to follow with me to Ilios on the decked ships? And it was a full month ere we had sailed all across the wide sea, for scarce could we win to our cause Odysseus, waster of cities. Then the ghost of Amphimedon answered him, and spake, Most famous son of Atreus, king of men, Agamemnon, I remember all these things, O fosterling of Zeus, as thou declarest them, and I in turn will tell thee all the tale well and truly, even our death and evil end, on what wise it befell. We wooed the wife of Odysseus that was long afar, and she neither refused the hated bridal nor was minded to make an end, devising for us death and black fate. Also this other while she contrived in her heart. She set up in her halls a mighty web, fine of woof and very wide, whereat she would weave, and anon she spake among us, Ye princely youths, my wars, now that goodly Odysseus is dead, do ye abide patiently, how eager soever to speed on this marriage of mine, till I finish the robe. I would not that the threads perish to no avail, even this shroud for the hero lets, against the day when the ruinous doom shall bring him low, of death that lays men at their length. So shall none of the Achaean women in the land count it blame in me, as well might be, were he to lie without a winding sheet, a man that had gotten great possessions. So spake she, and our high hearts consented thereto. So then in the daytime she would weave the mighty web, and in the night unravel the same, when she had let place the torches by her. Thus for the space of three years she hid the thing by guile and won the minds of the Achaeans, but when the fourth year arrived and the seasons came round, as the months waned and many days were accomplished, then it was that one of her women who knew all declared it, and we found her unravelling the splendid web. Thus she finished it perforce and saw against her will. Now when she brought the robe to light, after she had woven the great web and washed it, and it shone even as sun or moon, at that very hour some evil god led Odysseus, I know not whence, to the upland farm, where the swineherd abode in his dwelling. Thither too came the dear son of divine Odysseus out of sandy pylos, voyaging with his black ship. These twain framed an evil death for the wars, and came to the renowned town. Odysseus verily came the later, and Telemachus went before and led the way. Now the swineherd brought Odysseus clad in vile raiment, in the likeness of a beggar, a wretched man and an old, leaning on a staff, and behold, he was clad about in sorry raiment. And none of us, not even the elders, could know him for that he was, on this his sudden appearing, but with evil words we assailed him and hurled things at him. Yet for a while he hardened his heart to endure both the hurlings and the evil words in his own halls, but at the last, when the spirit of Zeus, lord of the Aegis, aroused him, by the help of Telemachus he took up all the goodly weapons, and laid them by in the inner chamber and drew the bolts. Next in his great craft he bade his wife to offer his bow and store of grey iron to the wolves to be the weapons of our contest, luckless that we were, and the beginning of death. Now not one of us could stretch the string of the strong bow, far short we fell of that might. But when the great bow came to the hands of Odysseus, then we all clamoured and forbade to give him the bow, how much soever he might speak, but Telemachus alone was instant with him and commanded him to take it. Then he took the bow into his hands, the steadfast goodly Odysseus, and lightly he strung it, and sent the arrow through the iron. Then straight he went to the threshold and there took his stand, and poured forth the swift arrows, glancing terribly around, and smote the king Antinous. Thereafter on the others he let fly his bolts, winged for death, with straight aim, and the wolves fell thick one upon another. Then was it known how that some god was their helper, for pressing on as their passion drave them, they slew the men right and left through the halls, and thence there arose a hideous moaning, as heads were smitten and the floor all ran with blood. 
So we perished, Agamemnon, and even now our bodies lie and cared for in the halls of Odysseus, for the friends of each one at home as yet know naught, even they who might wash the black clotted blood out of our wounds, and lay out the bodies and wail the dirge, for that is the dew of the dead. Then the ghost of the son of Atreus answered him, Ah, happy son of Laertes, Odysseus of many devices, yeah, for a wife most excellent hast thou gotten, so good was the wisdom of constant Penelope, daughter of Icarius, that was duly mindful of Odysseus, her wedded lord. Wherefore the fame of her virtue shall never perish, but the immortals will make a gracious song in the ears of men on earth to the fame of constant Penelope. In far otherwise did the daughter of Tyndareus devise ill deeds, and slay her wedded lord, and hateful shall the song of her be among men, and an evil repute she brought upon all womankind, even on the upright. Even so these twain spake one to the other, standing in the house of Hades, beneath the secret places of the earth. Now when those others had gone down from the city, quickly they came to the rich and well-ordered farm land of Laertes, that he had won for himself of old, as the prize of great toil in war. There was his house, and all about it ran the huts wherein the thralls were wont to eat and dwell and sleep, bondsmen that worked his will. And in the house there was an old Sicilian woman, who diligently cared for the old man, in the upland far from the city. There Odysseus spake to his thralls and to his son, saying, do ye now get you within the well-builded house, and quickly sacrifice the best of the swine for the midday meal, but I will make trial of my father, whether he will know me again, and be aware of me when he sees me, or know me not, so long have I been away. Therewith he gave the thralls his weapons of war. Then they went speedily to the house, while Odysseus drew near to the fruitful vineyard to make trial of his father. Now he found not Dolius there, as he went down into the great garden, nor any of the thralls nor of their sons. It chanced that they had all gone to gather stones for a garden fence and the old man at their head. So he found his father alone in the terraced vineyard, digging about a plant. He was clothed in a filthy doublet, patched and unseemly, with clouted leggings of oxide bound about his legs, against the scratches of the thorns, and long sleeves over his hands by reason of the brambles, and on his head he wore a goatskin cap, and so he nursed his sorrow. Now when the steadfast goodly Odysseus saw his father thus wasted with age and in great grief of heart, he stood still beneath a tall pear tree and let fall a tear. Then he communed with his heart and soul, whether he should fall on his father's neck and kiss him, and tell him all, how he had returned and come to his own country, or whether he should first question him and prove him in every word. And as he thought within himself, this seemed to him the better way, namely, first to prove his father and speak to him sharply. So with this intent the goodly Odysseus went up to him. Now he was holding his head down and kept digging about the plant, while his renowned son stood by him and spake, saying, Old man, thou hast no lack of skill in tending a garden, lo, thou carest well for all, nor is there aught whatsoever, either plant or fig tree, or vine, yeah, or olive, or pear, or garden bed in all the close, that is not well seen to. Yet another thing will I tell thee and lay not up wrath the rat in thy heart. Thyself art scarce so well cared for, but a pitiful old age is on thee, and withal thou art withered and unkempt, and clad unseemly. It cannot be to punish thy sloth that thy master cares not for thee, there shows nothing of the slave about thy face and stature, for thou art like a kingly man, even like one who should lie soft, when he has washed and eaten well, as is the manner of the aged. But come declare me this and plainly tell it all. Whose thrall art thou, and whose garden dost thou tend? Tell me moreover truly, that I may surely know, if it be indeed to Ithaca that I am now come, as one yonder told me who met with me but now on the way hither. He was but of little understanding, for he deigned not to tell me all nor to heed my saying, when I questioned him concerning my friend, whether indeed he is yet alive or is even now dead and within the house of Hades. For I will declare it and do thou mark and listen, once did I kindly entreat a man in mine own dear country, who came to our home and never yet has any mortal been dearer of all the strangers that have drawn to my house from afar. He declared him to be by lineage from out of Ithaca, and said that his own father was Laird's son of Arcesius. So I led him to our halls and gave him good entertainment, with all loving kindness, out of the plenty that was within. Such gifts too I gave him as other due of guests, of well-wrought gold I gave him seven talents, and a mixing bowl of flowered work, all of silver, and twelve cloaks of single fold 
and as many coverlets, and as many goodly mantles and doublets to boot, and besides all these, for women skilled in all fair works and most comely, the women of his choice. Then his father answered him, weeping, Stranger, thou art verily come to that country whereof thou askest, but outrageous men and froward hold it. And these thy gifts, thy countless gifts, thou didst bestow in vain. For if thou hadst found that man yet living in the land of Ithaca he would have sent thee on thy way with good return of thy presence, and with all hospitality, as is due to the man that begins the kindness. But come, declare me this and plainly tell me all, how many years are passed since thou didst entertain him, thy guest ill-fated and my child. If ever such an one there was, hapless man, whom far from his friends and his country's soil, the fishes, it may be, have devoured in the deep sea, or on the shore he has fallen the prey of birds and beasts. His mother wept not over him nor clad him for burial, nor his father, we that begat him. Nor did his bride, whom men sought with rich gifts, the constant Penelope, bewail her lord upon the bier, as was meet, nor closed his eyes, as is the due of the departed. Moreover, tell me this truly, that I may surely know, who art thou and whence of the sons of men? Where is thy city and where are they that begat thee? Where now is thy swift ship moored, that brought thee thither with thy godlike company? As thou come as a passenger on another's ship, while they set thee ashore and went away. Then Odysseus of many counsels answered him, saying, Yea now, I will tell thee all most plainly. From out of Alibas I come, where I dwell in a house renowned, and am the son of Aphidas the son of Polypemon, the prince, and my own name is Eperitus. But some god drave me wandering hither from Sicania against my will, and yonder my ship is moored toward the upland away from the city. But for Odysseus, this is now the fifth year since he went thence and departed out of my country. Ill-fated was he, and yet he had birds of good omen when he fared away, birds on the right, wherefore I sped him gladly on his road, and gladly he departed, and the heart of us twain hoped yet to meet in friendship on a day and to give splendid gifts. So he spake, and on the old man fell a black cloud of sorrow. With both his hands he clutched the dust and ashes and showered them on his grey head, with ceaseless groaning. Then the heart of Odysseus was moved, and up through his nostrils throbbed anon the keen sting of sorrow at the sight of his dear father. And he sprang towards him and fell on his neck and kissed him, saying, Behold, I hear, even I, my father, and the man of whom thou askest, in the twentieth year am I come to mine own country. But stay thy weeping and tearful lamentation, for I will tell thee all clearly, though great need there is of haste. I have slain the wolves in our halls and avenged their bitter scorn and evil deeds. Then Laertes answered him and spake, saying, If thou art indeed Odysseus, mine own child, that art come hither, show me now a manifest token, that I may be assured. Then Odysseus of many counsels answered him saying, Look first on this scar and consider it, that the boar dealt me with his white tusk on Parnassus, whither I had gone, and thou didst send me forth, thou and my lady mother, to Autolycus my mother's father, to get the gifts which when he came hither he promised and covenanted to give me. But come, and I will even tell thee the trees through all the terraced garden, which thou gavest me once for mine own, and I was begging of thee this and that, being but a little child, and following thee through the garden. Through these very trees we were going, and thou didst tell me the names of each of them. Pear trees thirteen thou gavest me, and ten apple trees and figs two score, and, as we went, Thou didst name the fifty rows of vines thou wouldest give me, whereof each one ripened at divers times, with all manner of clusters on their boughs, when the seasons of Zeus wrought mightily on them from on high. So he spake, and straightway his knees were loosened, and his heart melted within him, as he knew the sure tokens that Odysseus showed him. About his dear son he cast his arms, and the steadfast goodly Odysseus caught him fainting to his breast. Now when he had got breath and his spirit came to him again, once more he answered and spake, saying, Father Zeus, verily ye gods yet bear sway on high Olympus, if indeed the wolves have paid for their infatuate pride. But now my heart is terribly afraid, lest straightway all the men of Ithaca come up against us here, and haste to send messengers everywhere to the cities of the Cephallenians. Then Odysseus of many counsels answered him saying, Take courage, and let not thy heart be careful about these matters. But come, let us go to the house that lies near the garden, for thither I sent forward Telemachus and the neat herd and the swine herd to get ready the meal as speedily as may be. After these words the twain set out to the goodly halls. Now when they had come to the fair lying house, they found Telemachus and the neat herd and the swine herd carving much flesh and mixing the dark wine. 
Meanwhile the Sicilian handmaid bathed high-hearted Lertz in his house, and anointed him with olive oil, and cast a fair mantle about him. Then Athene drew nigh, and made greater the limbs of the shepherd of the people, taller she made him than before and mightier to behold. Then he went forth from the bath, and his dear son marveled at him, beholding him like to the deathless gods in presence. And uttering his voice he spake to him winged words. Father, surely one of the gods that are from everlasting hath made thee goodlier and greater to behold. Then wise Laertes answered him, saying, Ah, would to father Zeus and Athene and Apollo, that such as I was when I took Nericus, the established castle on the foreland of the continent, being then the prince of the Cephallenians, would that in such might, and with mail about my shoulders, I had stood to aid thee yesterday in our house, and to beat back the wars, so should I have loosened the knees of many and one of them in the halls and thou shouldest have been gladdened in thine inmost heart. So they spake each with the other. But when the others had ceased from their task and made ready the feast, they sat down all orderly on chairs and on high seats. Then they began to put forth their hands on the meat, and the old man Dolius drew nigh, and the old man's sons withal came tired from their labor in the fields, for their mother, the aged Sicilian woman, had gone forth and called them. She that saw to their living and diligently cared for the old man, now that old age had laid hold on him. So soon as they looked on Odysseus and took knowledge of him, they stood still in the halls in great amazement. But Odysseus addressed them in gentle words, saying, Old man, sit down to meat and do ye forget your marveling, for long have we been eager to put forth our hands on the food, as we abode in the hall all we expecting your coming. So he spake, and Dolius ran straight toward him stretching forth both his hands, and he grasped the hand of Odysseus and kissed it on the wrist, and uttering his voice spake to him winged words. Beloved, forasmuch as thou hast come back to us who saw desired thee, and no longer thought to see thee, and the gods have led thee home again, hail to thee and welcome manifold, and may the gods give thee all good fortune. Moreover tell me this truly that I may be assured, whether wise Penelope yet knows well that thou hast come back hither, or whether we shall dispatch a messenger. Then Odysseus of many counsels answered saying, Old man, already she knows all, what need to busy thyself herewith. Thereon the other sat him down again on his polished settle. And in like wise the sons of Dolius gathered about the renowned Odysseus, and greeted him well and clasped his hands, and then sat down all orderly by Dolius their father. So they were busy with the meal in the halls. Now rumor the messenger went swiftly all about the city, telling the tale of the dire death and fate of the wars. And the people heard it, and all at once gathered together from every side with sighing and groaning before the house of Odysseus. And each brought forth his dead from the halls, and buried them, but those that came out of other cities they placed on swift ships and sent with fisher folk, each to be carried to his own home. As for them they all fared together to the assembly place, in sorrow of heart. When they were all gathered and come together, Eupethes arose and spake among them, for a comfortless grief lay heavy on his heart for his son Antinous, the first man that goodly Odysseus had slain. Weeping for him he made harangue and spake among them. Friends, a great deed truly hath this man devised against the Achaeans. Some with his ships he led away, many men, and noble, and his hollow ships hath he lost, and utterly lost of his company, and others again, and those far the best of the Cephallenians he hath slain on his coming home. Up now, before ever he gets him swiftly either to Pylos or to Fair Ellis, where the Epeans bear sway, let us go forth, else even hereafter shall we have shame of face for ever. For a scorn this is even for the ears of men unborn to hear, if we avenge not ourselves on the slayers of our sons and of our brethren. Life would no more be sweet to me, but rather would I die straightway and be with the departed. Up, let us be going, lest these fellows be beforehand with us and get them over the sea. Thus he spake weeping, and pity fell on all the Achaeans. Then came near to them Medan and the divine minstrel, forth from the halls of Odysseus, for that sleep had let them go. They stood in the midst of the gathering, and amazement seized every man. Then Medan, wise of heart, spake among them, saying, Hearken to me now, ye men of Ithaca, for surely Odysseus planned not these deeds without the will of the gods. Nay I myself beheld a god immortal, who stood hard by Odysseus, in the perfect semblance of mentor, now as a deathless god was he manifest in front of Odysseus, cheering him, and yet again scaring the wolves he stormed through the hall, and they fell thick one on another. Thus he spake, and pale fear gat hold of the limbs of all. Then the old man, the lord Halithersis, spake among them, the son of master, for he alone saw before and after. 
Out of his good will be made harangue and spake among them, saying, Hearken to me now, ye men of Ithaca, to the word that I will say. Through your own cowardice, my friends, have these deeds come to pass. For ye obeyed not me, nor mentor, the shepherd of the people, to make your sons cease from their foolish ways. A great villainy they wrought in their evil infatuation, wasting the wealth and holding in no regard the wife of a prince, while they deemed that he would never more come home. And now let things be on this wise, and obey my counsel. Let us not go forth against him, lest haply some may find a bane of their own bringing. So he spake, but they leapt up with a great cry, the more part of them, while the rest abode there together, for his counsel was not to the mind of the more part, but they gave ear to you peaths, and swiftly thereafter they rushed for their armor. So when they had arrayed them in shining mail, they assembled together in front of the spacious town. And Eupeths led them in his witlessness, for he thought to avenge the slaying of his son, yet himself was never to return, but then and there to meet his doom. Now Athene spake to Zeus, the son of Cronos, saying, O father, our father Cronides, throned in the highest, answer and tell me what is now the hidden counsel of thy heart. Wilt thou yet further rouse up evil war and the terrible din of battle, or art thou minded to set them at one again in friendship? Then Zeus, the gatherer of the clouds, answered her saying, My child, why dost thou thus straightly question me, and ask me this? Nay didst not thou thyself devise this very thought, namely, that Odysseus should indeed take vengeance on these men at his coming? Do as thou wilt, but I will tell thee of the better way. Now that goodly Odysseus hath wreaked vengeance on the wars, let them make a firm covenant together with sacrifice, and let him be king all his days, and let us bring about oblivion of the slaying of their children and their brethren, so may both sides love one another as of old, and let peace and wealth abundant be their portion. Therewith he roused Athene to yet greater eagerness, and from the peaks of Olympus she came glancing down. Now when they had put from them the desire of honey sweet food, the steadfast goodly Odysseus began to speak among them, saying, let one go forth and see, lest the people be already drawing near against us. So he spake, and the son of Dolius went forth at his bidding, and stood on the outer threshold and saw them all close at hand. Then straightway he spake to Odysseus winged words. Here they be, close upon us. Quick, let us to arms. Thereon they rose up and arrayed them in their harness, Odysseus and his men being four and the six sons of Dolius, and likewise Lets and Dolius did on their armor, gray-headed as they were, warriors through stress of need. Now when they had clad them in shining mail, they opened the gates and went forth, and Odysseus led them. Then Athene, daughter of Zeus, drew near them in the likeness of Mentor, in fashion and in voice. And the steadfast goodly Odysseus beheld her and was glad, and straightway he spake to Telemachus his dear son. Telemachus, soon shalt thou learn this, when thou thyself art got to the place of the battle where the best men try the issue, namely, not to bring shame on thy father's house, on us who in time past have been eminent for might and hardihood over all the world. Then wise Telemachus answered him, saying, Thou shalt see me, if thou wilt, dear father, in this my mood no whit disgracing thy line, according to thy word. So spake he, and Let's was glad and spake, saying, What a day has dawned for me, kind gods, yea, yeah, a glad man am I. My son and my son's son are vying with one another in valor. Then grey-eyed Athene stood beside Laertes, and spake to him, O son of Arcesius that art father dearest of all my friends, pray first to the grey-eyed maid and to Father Zeus, then swing thy long spear aloft and hurl it straightway. Therewith Pallas Athene breathed into him great strength. Then he prayed to the daughter of mighty Zeus, and straightway swung his long spear aloft and hurled it, and smote Eupeeps through his cask with the cheekpiece of bronze. The armor kept not out the spear that went clean through, and he fell with a crash, and his arms rattled about his body. Then Odysseus and his renowned son fell on the forefighters, and smote them with swords and two-headed spears. And now would they have slain them all and cut off their return, had not Athene called aloud, the daughter of Zeus lord of the Aegis, and stayed all the host of the enemy, saying, Hold your hands from fierce fighting, ye men of Ithaca, that so ye may be parted quickly, without bloodshed. So spake Athene, and pale fear gat hold of them all. The arms flew from their hands in their terror and fell all upon the ground, as the goddess uttered her voice. To the city they turned their steps, as men fain of life, and the steadfast goodly Odysseus with a terrible cry gathered himself together and hurled in on them, like an eagle of lofty flight. Then in that hour the son of Cronos cast forth a flaming bolt, and it fell at the feet of the grey-eyed goddess, the daughter of the mighty sire. 
Then grey-eyed Athene spake to Odysseus, saying, Son of Laetus, of the seed of Zeus, Odysseus of many devices, refrain thee now and stay the strife of even-handed war, lest perchance the son of Cronos be angry with thee, even Zeus of the far-born voice. So spake Athene, and he obeyed and was glad at heart. And thereafter Pallas Athene set a covenant between them with sacrifice, she, the daughter of Zeus lord of the Aegis, in the likeness of Mentor, both in fashion and in voice. Thank you for watching. We hope you have enjoyed the Odyssey of Homer. Please let us know in the comments if there are any other classic works you would like us to present. We would love to hear from you.